This week's number, 12%. That's the percentage of Black Friday shoppers who are drunk 60% of the time. Alcohol works 100% of the time for the dog. That was good. Welcome to Prop G Markets. We've got a special episode for you today focused on an American Thanksgiving tradition, Black Friday, and its more recent offspring, Cyber Monday. Here with the good word is Prop G Media Analyst Ed Elson. Ed, talk to us about Black Friday. The tradition of Black Friday discounts began in the 1970s as retailers tried to attract shoppers flush with holiday present budgets. It started as sales on Friday, then stores started opening at midnight Thursday, and finally, special openings on the afternoon of Thanksgiving itself. It's even made it across the UK where stores have Black Friday sales, even though Thanksgiving is not a UK holiday. Scott, you're about the same age as Black Friday. What was holiday shopping experience like when you were a kid? I'm about the same age as Black Friday? I wasn't expecting that. (laughs) I really enjoy that footage of people crushing each other. It makes me feel better about myself and my life. Uh, That's my favorite part of Black Friday, when they open the doors and a bunch of people trample on each other. (laughs) I know that should make me happy. It does. I find that joyous. Mm. Uh, So I can't stand the holidays. I don't like the consumer part of it. Uh, I think that's a holdover from my uh, privileged yet vastly underprivileged life. Um, I remember as a kid, uh, like at the age of eight, going out one day and seeing all these new toys. And my friends told me about, you know, Christmas. My parents, we didn't have Christmas. And I know that sounds very sad. Uh, and I said, what's, you know, what's going on here? Everyone's got toys but me. And so they started doing stuff. The next year, my parents got divorced, and Christmas mo- was mostly about the opportunity for them to send vile messages via me to each other. But my mom, we were economically strained, and my mom uh, is, is smart, and she said, okay, this is what you're going to do. On Christmas Day, you're going to go to your friends' houses and make a list of what you want. And then she said on December the 26th, we're going to go to the stores or I'm going to go to the stores and buy all this stuff on sale. And then we're going to have Christmas on December the 27th. And it was just weird. It was just weird. But I'm sure she was able to buy stuff on sale. Uh, and the thing about the thing about the, um, I don't know, the retail ecosystem back then was literally the day after Christmas, uh, everything was 30 to 50 percent off. But it did feel a little unnatural. It felt like you were... You know, it felt like you were being smart, but sort of in a dystopian way. Yeah, Christmas. Mm-hmm. So I've always, you know, the bottom line is I fucking hate the holidays. I hate everything about them. Anyways, back to you, Ed. To get the retailer's perspective, why do they promote Black Friday and Cyber Monday? Prof G Media's editor-in-chief, Jason Stavers, spoke with Catherine Cullen, the senior director of industry and consumer insights for the National Retail Federation. So thanks, Catherine. Uh, Maybe you could start just with the quickie, introduce yourself and the briefest bit about your background, and then we'll get into the questions. Absolutely. I'm Catherine Cullen. I'm the Senior Director for Industry and Consumer Insights at the National Retail Federation. And as part of that, I cover all things related to holiday, consumer spending, as well as broader trends that we're seeing in the industry. Thanks. So the subject of our show today is Black Friday, but I'd like to start with a somewhat broader question, which is just generally, why do retailers have sales at all? Why don't they? I mean, it seems like a pretty obvious thing in our consumer world, but if we could just step back, what is the function of a sale? Why is it a piece of the retailer's um, uh, toolbox? Well, a sale can perform a number of functions. It can be a way to clear out excess inventory, um, but it can also be a way to attract shoppers, um, to get them either in your store or on your site to maybe attract a consumer that you haven't, uh, who hasn't been with you before, as well as if it's a special access type of sale reward the loyalty of your best customers. So a sale, there's no single function that it uh, performs, um, but it can be used in a variety of, of different ways. We have seen, you know, since the 
since the Great Recession, um, there has been this impulse on the part of consumers for, for deal hunting. And so a sale can also be a little bit of an entertainment uh, function for consumers. It can be a bit of an experience uh, in sort of finding that perfect item at that perfect price. So how has the day after Thanksgiving become such a tremendously important part of our retail landscape and such a big sale day? Well, Black Friday and really, as we started, as we as we talk about it now, sort of the Thanksgiving weekend holiday shopping event, um, it was you know, really has evolved into a five days of shopping. And I will talk about this a little bit, but maybe even a month of shopping uh, that kicks off now on Thanksgiving Day and goes all the way into Cyber Monday. Um, And it really did used to be sort of the um, mental start to the holiday shopping season. It was when all the big deals started and uh, people got into the holiday rush. Now it's much more of the halfway point. Uh, we're seeing holiday sales and promotions start um, in many cases early November, if not before Halloween. Um, but for consumers, there's something in retailers, there's something very uh, memorable, something very nostalgic about Black Friday. It's a time when people expect to see really great deals on top gift items, whether that's toys or electronics. Um, And it's also a tradition, an American tradition in a lot of ways that I think has uh, retained its um, popularity uh, for consumers. And uh, that's why we continue to see so much focus on it, even if Black Friday is sort of taking place as early as um, October now. So for, you mentioned that retailers have different reasons for having sales and might be trying to serve different objectives. Are those all at play on Black Friday and in Thanksgiving holiday weekend, or is there a particular function that these sales serve for retailers? Well, certainly every retailer is going to have slightly different uh, motivations and drivers. That said, for a uh, Thanksgiving weekend type sales, you know, we, we see a little bit less of that impulsive kind of moving excess inventory. Um, instead, it's about attracting those shoppers, those new shoppers, rewarding your uh, most loyal shoppers, and um, satisfying that entertainment component, uh, whether that's kind of a you know, a deal of the day type of thing, or as we've seen uh, from um, more e-commerce driven retailers, a deal of the moment or deal of the hour, uh, there's certainly this kind of hunting and uh, treasure seeking aspect that um, is fun for people and they they enjoy uh, while also knocking items off their holiday shopping list. So in preparation for this show, we did some research into why it's called Black Friday. And it it doesn't seem like there's a any one answer or any one sure answer. But one of the things that you sometimes hear, and this feels like it got added on after the fact, is that this is the weekend that retailers make it into the black. It's when they start their turning a profit for the year. Uh, it does. Do you think that has much truth to it? And then just more generally, how important is this sales weekend for the financial results of major retailers? Mm-hmm. Uh, so this really ties, uh, I've also heard many different explanations for why it's called Black Friday. Um, but, you know, the nature of Black Friday and the place it holds in the retail calendar has really changed. Those sales, uh, certainly it is a big sale weekend. Um, but in the sense that it makes or breaks a retailer's holiday season, um, I think a lot of pressure has been taken away from Black Friday as a standalone or Thanksgiving weekend as a standalone event. Uh, We've really seen consumers uh, shift their behavior. So consumers, whether it was because of the supply chain challenges or inflation uh, right now, they want to start their shopping earlier. Um, This has been a trend that's been going on for the last decade, but has really accelerated in the last a couple of years, um, they want they spend a lot of money during the holidays. They want to spread out that budget. They 
enjoy the experience of Black Friday shopping, but don't want the stress of having to buy everything in that moment. Um, so as sales have gotten spread out, um, you know, that takes some of the pressure away from that single weekend. That said, the months of November and December, if we look at those as a whole, are some of the most important uh, months of the year for retailers and in many senses is where they, they can um, you know, generate a, a large portion of their of their profits and their revenue. Um, you know, just to to mention here, you know, we are expecting that that overall retail sales during uh, the last two months of the year are going to grow somewhere between six and eight percent over last year's uh, record uh, growth. So, on top of last year's record growth, so um, it can still be a very um, it is still a very important time of the year, but the pressure on that single weekend. And, um, has has kind of um, gone down. So it's interesting. We've seen uh, inflation return as has been widely reported, something that we hadn't seen in, in really in decades. Uh, we're seeing layoffs in some areas of the economy and a lot of indications of, of sort of weak economy. But like you said, last year we had an incredibly strong holiday shopping season and you guys are expecting another one this year. Um, where do you think that strength is coming from? There's a lot of factors driving what we're seeing right now. And, and the first thing I would say is, you know, inflation does not impact all consumers or all areas of the economy in exactly the same way. Uh, someone who is seeing really um, their costs go up because of gas um, is impacted in a, in a different way than someone who doesn't have a car or uses public transportation. Uh, we're also seeing that consumers at different income levels are being impacted in different ways. Higher income households have a lot more, they might be just as worried about inflation, but they have a lot more bandwidth to absorb uh, some of the higher costs. Lower income households, on the other hand, might be feeling a little more hesitant, uh, might be, you know, readjusting some of their plans for the holiday season uh, to account for other areas of their budget. Uh, but overall, retail spending is is still continuing on, on a strong path, and the holidays um, and gifting are a key part of that. Uh, the other thing I would note is that, you know, we still are seeing a lot of um, savings in the economy. Uh, consumers overall saved a great amount uh, during the pandemic, whether it was through stimulus funds that they received or just because, you know, they weren't um, paying for daycare, whether they wish they could or not, or um, they weren't traveling as much. And so there are there is still excess cash and consumers do have that um you know, at their disposal when they're thinking about things like holidays and, and special events. Uh, last thing I would say is the holidays are a very emotional time. We have to remember this isn't just, you know, a, a regular time of the year. People want to get together with family, particularly um, given things seem to be in a different place about with the pandemic, though I will knock on wood, we've learned that can change very quickly. Um, and so people are looking forward to getting together. They're looking forward to gifting and they're looking forward to to celebrating, um, and some of that does involve uh, spending on on some of these categories. Uh, you mentioned the pandemic. Uh, obviously, the pandemic had dramatic effects in the short term on how we shopped and what we bought and that sort of thing. Do you see it having an impact more structurally and over the long term on this Thanksgiving holiday shopping weekend and the nature of these sales? Yes, I mean I think. In a lot of ways, the pandemic it built on and accelerated trends that were already happening. So a move to more contactless modes of payment, for example, that we're seeing. Um, we saw that really take off during the pandemic, but those trends were already building and people just were more motivated to adopt them because of um, concerns around around COVID. Uh, buy online, pick up in store, and curbside, which had already been growing in popularity, again, you know, grew exponentially during the pandemic. Um, but some of the other ways that I think um, some of the some of the bigger trends I think it's important to keep uh, an eye on is I think the pandemic really demonstrated that. Um, Consumers don't want to be pushed to just online or just in store. Um, they want choices in, in how they shop and, and they want to be able to combine and, and cross channels pretty seamlessly. So, you know, that means 
being able to shop online Thanksgiving day because I'm full of Turkey and don't want to head to the store. Um, and, um, but I want to be able to head to the store on black Friday and then to browse with friends and, you know, maybe I forgot something. So I'm going to use curbside pickup, um, out of convenience because that's the fastest way for me to get an everyday necessity. Um, I think we also saw some of the, you know, strains on supply chain and that, you know, assuming that online is the fastest way to get something, it was not necessarily true. We're seeing, you know, more evolution and more adoption of these different last mile technologies, uh, you know, services that you interface with a retailer to bring something to you from the store, or again, using things like curbside. Um, and the last thing is, you know, I, I think this is still playing out, but, you know, we saw consumers' willingness to try new things from a technology standpoint, um, you know, kind of kind of come to bear. But I think also it, it shook up consumers' attitudes towards which brands they shopped because, you know, due to product shortages, people maybe reconsidered, you know, my favorite brand of X item is not available, but I need it. Um, what can I find? And I think we're seeing that that openness to trying new brands, you know, continue, particularly with pressures like inflation um, and people being a little more cost conscious. I think we'll continue to see more shopping around um, a willingness to trade over to different brands, whether it's trading down or just considering something else that's that's in stock. So um, I think we will have a better idea of how the pandemic's impacted our, our spending. And, you know, in a couple of years, I'm sure we're going to see lots of books and lots of talk about it. Um, but at least initially, those are those are some of the things that I'm seeing play out. And I think we'll see play out over the holidays. Great. Okay, last couple questions, two questions that are kind of related. First is, do we know if the discounts that are being offered by retailers over this weekend are consistent over time or have they gotten better or less recently? You know, that can really vary by retailer. Um, we can tell you from a consumer perspective, um, consumers have felt the deals have been about the same year to year for the last couple of years. Um, you know, it's also where we may see a change is, you know, I think retailers, many retailers have moved to sort of a more targeted promotion strategy uh, during the holidays. So rather than, you know, X percent off, over an entire weekend or over the entire month. And some retailers, by the way, are still doing that because that's what works best for their business. But a lot of them, I think we're seeing a little bit more of targeted um, in the moment promotions. You know, this item, almost like the door busters that we used to talk about um, back when people were lining up for Black Friday and, and uh you know, Thanksgiving days for stores to open. Um, some of those more loss leader type things. Um, so deals of the moment or um, kind of a more short term attitude towards some of these promotions, which again, I think plays into that entertainment aspect that consumers, you know, feel like, oh, this is something I'm getting because it's special right now and it, it might not be here tomorrow. Uh, so I think we are seeing a little bit more of that throughout the season. Could you explain those terms for our listeners, the loss leader or doorbuster? Yes, certainly. So a doorbuster, I'm sure there are lots of ways to define it, but for a lot of retailers, it's those items that are right at the door when people enter in, they're often heavily um, marked down um, and are a way to, people are excited about them. They they often kind of line up knowing that item's going to be really um, discounted um, and then they will continue kind of shopping through throughout the store. Um, loss leader is, is, is sort of tied to that, but it's this idea that you can heavily discount an, an item, probably taking a little bit of a loss at it um, because it's going to get people into your store on your site and they're going to spend a lot more money uh, that you will make up in other ways. So one thing we've seen in retail generally, right, is that everyday low pricing and sort of price leadership across the board is, is obviously always been a strategy, but Amazon has brought a general low price strategy to the market. Walmart's been very successful with sort of an everyday low pricing model. Uh, is there a, is there a broader shift towards price certainty and just knowing that you're always getting the lowest price with the availability of internet tools to comparison shop? Does that undermine the value of a sale? I think it impacts. 
I know that it undermines the value of a sale because again, there there are other emotional components yeah. to sale um, that aren't just just price driven, um, and I think it will vary by retailer. You know. Louis Vuitton offering everyday low prices is just not going to uh, just not going to have the same um, meaning as as a mass merchant or you know luxury brand just in general is going to be performing performing differently or a good that is perceived as a more of a luxury good. Um, so I think it will really uh, depend by retailer and also product type. You know, if it's an everyday item that you are purchasing a um, necessity or a staple, you know, maybe consumers are a little tired of hunting around and do just want the general certainty that I know I'm getting a good value here. I know that it's consistently a good price um, and I don't have to you know, check 10 different sites or coupon books to make sure that milk or bread here is, is the best price for it. That said, you know, consumers who are at the lower end of the income scale who are being impacted by higher prices on um, on everyday essentials in particular, they are looking for those those um, those deals on those items. And, and we may continue to see, you know, that behavior move up, um, you know, depending on whether or not inflation starts to ease or not um, in terms of you know, whether or not we're going to see kind of this general price transparency um, and price consistency. I, I do think there is some appeal for, for that on the part of consumers and a way to build loyalty and trust on the part of brands. But I think it's a little early to, to kind of play out. Um, the last thing I would note is just in our most recent holiday research um, in October, you know, we did ask people kind of what draws you to a to a brand, and, and obviously price um, is a is a big motivator. Um, but we did not see a big uptick in price as a as a big driver to shop a retailer um, from last year. It was about it was actually the same. Um, and then other factors like uh, customer service, quality, um, consistency, um, those remained just as high as they have been in the past, uh, which to me, you know, says consumers, you know, they know they can find a good price. They know they can hunt a sale. Um, but there are, as we know, other factors that impact their decision to to shop with you. And I think in the in the focus on price, we can't forget about those other factors because that bad customer service experience, that issue with quality, um, that's going to turn people away, even if you do have the lowest price. Super. Thanks so much. Is there any other insights or sort of surprising things you're seeing in this preparation for this holiday shopping season that you could share with our listeners? Um, you know, the, the last thing I would just bring up and, you know, it might be interesting is, you know, we, this is a little bit related back to the pandemic. Um, but, you know, we talked a lot during the pandemic about one of the things that was fueling retail shopping was the shift from services to goods. So you weren't taking those vacations, you were sitting at home, you were outfitting your home office, uh, you were taking that money, you were spending, you know, dining out and um, spending it on retail. And there was a lot of expectation that, you know, as things opened up, we would see that swing back to services. And, and certainly we are seeing, you know, people traveling a lot more, people dining out, but it does seem that some of these habits um, that we you know, adopted during the pandemic have, have kind of stayed. So for example, you know, people discovered that they enjoyed cooking at home, um, you know, take home meals, um, grocery shopping, all those pots you invested in during the pandemic and those sourdough starters, uh, people, it seems like are continuing to, to do that. So we, we may not see, at least in the near term, that full shift back to services. It, it seems that we've changed our lifestyle enough that uh, some of this spending is going to continue to stay in, in goods. So, yeah, just last thing I wanted to call out. We like we like our things, I guess. We do like our things. Yeah, things and our nesting. All right. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Absolutely. Great. Thank you guys for reaching out. It was great to chat with you all. That's the industry's latest thinking on Black Friday, but it remains a durable American retail tradition. With inflation starting to tighten budgets, interest in discount shopping is up significantly this year. 
58% of holiday shoppers say that sales and promotions are more important to them when shopping for gifts and other holiday items this year compared with last year, from 48% in September 2021. So sales and discounts remain popular, but Scott, is there an alternative approach here? People understand what a sale is, but try and go deeper, and that is what what's the real value? And what a sale is saying is that there is scarcity value, and that is this product at this price doesn't last very long. And a sale is meant to create a sense of urgency, ultimately driven by a sense of scarcity. And I would argue that the term sale has become less effective as a means of establishing that scarcity. Now, what do we mean by that? The new sale, if you will, is everyday low pricing. And that is Costco, the most successful retailers in the world, Costco, Walmart, to a lesser extent Target, have established this notion that they're kind of on sale every day, that you can trust them, that you're getting a certain amount of price certainty. So they don't need to have sales. As a matter of fact, I think some of the better malls in America and all the shitty malls have basically gone away. So the higher end malls, I believe, actually prohibit retailers from putting the term sale in their windows. So there's new forms of creating that sense of scarcity. At the low end, you have a constant sense that everything's on sale, so everyday low pricing. And then at the higher end, what I've noticed is some of the higher end stores have stuck with their pandemic distancing strategies where they only let in a limited number of people into the store and lines form outside of the store. Because what happens when you see a line? You immediately stop and go, what are they lining up for? And whatever they're lining up for, the wisdom of crowds means I want it. So I believe that Chanel, for example, is purposely constricting traffic into their stores, uh, even though they don't need to socially distance any longer, to create the ultimate branded vehicle and sense of scarcity, and that is a line outside of their store. That is the new sale, the sense of scarcity, if you will. So e-commerce and everyday low prices are lessening value of sales. The new discounting, as we mentioned, is price certainty. 81% of retail shoppers conduct online research before buying something in person. However, to be clear, promotional pricing has not gone away. After Walmart publicized everyday low prices, many supermarkets followed suit. But researchers have found my whole talk track here may not be the case in all instances. As a matter of fact, they found that sometimes sales yielded more money than the EDLP or everyday low pricing strategy. Even Walmart has conceded to the power of discounting with so-called rollbacks, which is kind of Walt knees for sale. Uh, retailers should be looking to give consumers confidence that they got the best price, see above everyday low prices. So how do we square this circle? The bottom line is it's situational, and that is if you're Walmart, probably an EDLP strategy is going to make sense. Uh, depending on region, you're going to look at consumer behavior. Sometimes sales drive just more footfall. So it's situational, and it's your ability to look at the data and see what's working and do A-B testing. As Catherine pointed out, sales are more than just discounts. They can be nostalgic traditions, and they can be a form of entertainment. Ironically, lower prices can mean people spend more money. And the rising popularity of buy now, pay later is making it even easier to spend money we don't have. Scott, do you worry that easy credit and more sophisticated marketing strategies will get American consumers in trouble? Uh, yeah, I, I do worry about it. I think a lot about the algebra of wealth and how you get wealthy. And one of those, a key pillar of getting getting wealthier is to be a bit of a stoic. And that is to try and not fall into this consumer culture, which is, just, in my view, weird, and feel that a holiday is to go buy shit. I mean, use these sales and these events strategically and as weapons. And if you need a new Nespresso maker or you're looking for a jacket, fine. Take advantage of the lower cost. But don't fall into the notion that it's going to make you happy. There's a lot of studies on happiness that show that we overestimate the happiness things will give us. And we underestimate the happiness that experiences will give us. So in sum, when you're young, you know, drive a Hyundai and, you know, go to Africa. And also... The amount of stress you're going to place on yourself when you use credit or debt to buy things is just generally not worth it. The only time, in my view, you want to go into debt is occasionally for maybe educational purposes or investing in yourself or to buy a house or an asset that you think has, on a risk-adjusted basis, going to go up in value. Over 10 years, your house almost always goes up in value. Uh, but using debt or buy now, pay later, which I think is mendacious and terrible, or even getting out over your skis on credit is just a way to become the stress and anxiety you're going to feel from owing money is going to be much greater than the short-term dopa hit of buying shit. 
And I find there's a certain joy to living in a fairly non-cluttered lifestyle. And that is buy a few things that you like that you use for a long time, be strategic about the things you buy, but find dopa elsewhere. Find it in the gym, find it through uh, relationships, uh, find it through uh, find it through sex, find it through professional achievement. And I love making and spending money, but my advice to anyone under the age of 40 or 45 before you're economically secure is that stuff in this consumer culture is not your friend. Do you think regulation has a role to play in those sort of psychological effects of buy now, pay later and discounts and sales? You know, they psychologically make us want to spend more. And like we've said, that it's almost tricking us. Do you think humans need guardrails? And is it regulators' responsibility to put those guardrails in place? Or is that infantilizing us? I think the answer is yes. Look, I think being yeah. a, I think buy now, pay later is basically just a big marketing head fake. This notion mm-hmm. that oh, you're the part of the credit generation; it's more innovative, and oh, you're not you're not buying stuff on credit. You're being an innovator by doing BNPL. What bullshit! <laughs> what bullshit! You're buying shit you can't afford. Mm-hmm. And but the question is, should there be regulation? I think there should be transparency. I think that there should be education. I think they should be forced to say that whatever it was twenty five or fifty percent of late payments in California last quarter were on BNPL. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we should have more literacy, financial literacy. My kid can do calculus, but he doesn't understand we got him a credit card. He can barely understand the notion of interest rates. I think we need a lot more financial literacy in in high school. But I worry that any sort of regulation here, I think we should have I think we should have effective limits on interest rates so they don't become usurious and prey on people who don't have those skills. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you don't want to infantilize. My colleague asked about the motor and says the best regulation are life lessons. And I feel like a lot of these young people that engaged in BNPL and for some reason were under the illusion that it was innovative or they were doing something that somehow wouldn't require them to pay it back the way they need to pay back a credit card. Uh, it's just stupid, a lot of pain. I don't, I don't get it. I, I, mm-hmm. I kind of resent these companies and their founders' willingness to pretend or try and create a sleight of hand that somehow this was part of the innovation economy. Mm-hmm. What's the what's the downside of infantilizing? Like, you know, if it means protecting people, why is that a problem? It, is it a philosophical issue? What do you think? Well, it's sort of easy for me to say because I have the money to pay cash for stuff. And occasionally right. somebody says, you know, Coachella is really important to me and I want to look really good. So, I, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm going to do BNPL and I'll figure it out. Or people say, I want to borrow money to buy a car. Or I haven't seen my friends in a while. I want to go out to dinner and I'm going to put it on a credit card. I mean, it's credit and debt play an important role, not only in our economy, but also they can be, when managed well, they can be, you know, they can help smooth out the rough spots. So I don't, you know, it's sort of, you know, once I've gotten money, uh, then I start telling other people how to how to mm-hmm. manage their own personal finances. I don't. <laughs> You know, so part of this is you're an adult. You have to make these decisions. And there is something about America. My dad uh, has said, and my dad who is now 92, has said, America is a terrible place to be stupid. (laughs) And he said, you know, he's always said the reason why we have so many winners here is we allow people to lose. And if a firm like, if a buy now, pay later firm can convince young people that they should uh, spend more money. Uh, retailers benefited from this. I was on the board of Urban Outfitters. We love buy now, pay later because basket size went way up. Mm-hmm. And my guess is there was a lot of pain and my guess is there was a lot of learning, but there was also a lot of economic growth. Getting people to spend more money is generally speaking a good thing for our economy. One of the reasons the U.S. has the biggest economy in the world is that people are optimists and will spend more money than they have. And that sounds kind of counterintuitive, mm-hmm. but people are willing to issue people and companies credit and people are willing to spend more money than they have on certain things. So look, I I don't, you know, you're an adult. If you can drink yourself to death, if you can join the military, I'm not going to tell you you can't do buy now, pay later. Thanks, Scott. Let's take a look at the week ahead. We'll see November's unemployment rate. Last month was a particularly tough one for employees in the tech industry with mass layoffs at Twitter, Meta, Amazon, and a bunch of others. Scott, I usually ask you for a prediction at this point in the show, but today, do you have any words of wisdom for people who lost their jobs as we head into the holiday season? 
So, look, there's going to be a lot of layoffs in big tech, and it'll be more spectacle than significant. It's, it's a great employer, but in terms of absolute numbers, it's not a huge employer. But there's going to be a lot of people who grew up in an economy where there were never layoffs who are going to be laid off. And I think enduring this type of rejection is key to success. And so if you're laid off in the information economy, let's look at the reality of the situation. One, it likely means you're educated, if not really well educated, maybe even graduated from an elite university. Two, it usually means you live in a Western economy that is doing really well and you live under a democracy. Three, it means you're incredibly skilled. Most of these layoffs that are happening in big tech companies, guess what? We have no interest in speaking to someone who used to work for Amazon said no company ever. You're coming out in a strong labor market with incredible skills. You know, boss, <laughs> weakest or smallest violins ever. And if you do get laid off, if you do get laid off, uh, it's the same advice uh, that, that anyone should have around a disappointment. The only thing I know will happen in your life is that you will face tragedy and disappointment. You will get laid off. Someone not as talented as you will make more money or get promoted over you. Uh, worst of all, and all of this will seem trivial, uh, someone you love a great deal and who loves you immensely will get sick and die. Uh, life is an adventure uh, in apologies, uh, in joy, but also in tragedy. And being laid off is not the biggest one you will face. What the key to success is, in my view, that you can control, because unfortunately the key to success is mostly about where you're born and when you're born and some luck, but in terms of what you can control, number one or pretty high up there is resilience. And that is having the ability to mourn and move on. And the advice here is the same. If a relationship ends, if you lose somebody you love, if you get fired, give yourself time to mourn. There's nothing wrong with being depressed. And then move on. Put a statute of limitations on it. You lose somebody you love, you got a couple months, and then if you're not doing well, reach out to someone for help. You get fired, realize it's likely not your fault. It's likely not your fault. And do whatever you need to do, whether it's having the right people around you, whether it's repeating to yourself all the outstanding qualities you have to convince yourself that, one, you are the solution to a firm's problems. Two, you could make, someone life's, you could make someone else's life wonderful and that you have value. The difference between success and happiness is not a function of how awesome you are or how hard you work. It's a function of recognizing that a lot of your success and a lot of your failure is not your fault. You are the answer to a firm's problems. You will bring a lot of value and joy to someone else's life. Get up, dust up, get to the plate, and swing harder. This isn't about you. This isn't about you. This is about a structural shift in the economy and guess what? You're going to be just fine. And at the end of your life, what you will be most upset about is not that you were laid off, but how upset you were about it. You are going to be fine. That's all for this episode. Our producers are Claire Miller and Jason Stavers. Special thanks to Catherine Dillon, Ed Elson, Mia Silverio, and the PropG Media team. If you like what you heard, please follow, download, and subscribe. Thank you for listening to PropG Markets. We will catch you next week.